So you might remember the last two lectures we've been talking about matroids. Um, so two lectures ago we introduced matroids and, and gave some examples. Um, <coughs> and then last lecture we, we sort of got into some motivation for matroids. So in particular we proved that um, matroids are basically the structures where, where you know, uh, the greedy algorithm always gives the uh, optimal. <coughs> okay, so, so today what we're going to do, um, okay, so actually the tomorrow's lecture and Wednesday's lecture, we're going to look at more motivation for matroids, um, in particular matroid intersection algorithms and things like that. Um, today though, we're basically going to focus on properties of matroids themselves. So, <coughs> yeah, so I apologize in advance. I think this is going to be a sort of a slightly boring lecture where we're just kind of looking at definitions of things to do with matroids and proving things are equivalent, but, uh, but also the, these are kind of important, useful facts to know about matroids. Um, okay, so, so basically the theme for today is basically that there's, well, there are many ways, many equivalent ways to define a matroid. And these are going to be in terms of, um, so the standard way is in terms of the independent sets. So independent sets or bases or the rank function or in terms of something called circuits, which I'll define later. And yeah, okay, so yeah, so I'm not, I'm, I probably won't have time to prove all of the different equivalent ways of defining matroids, but, uh, but I'll prove at least a few of them. Any questions about anything? I've, okay, so, <clears throat> so I'll start by showing that basically, so for a matroid, you can define it equivalently in terms of its independent sets, which is the kind of standard definition, or you can define it in terms of its uh, bases, where you just have to verify that the bases have a certain property. Okay, so, so what do I mean by this? So let, so I'm going to assume that xi satisfies the first two properties of being a matroid. So let this satisfy one and two from the definition of a matroid. And suppose that so, and let B be the set of all, um, well, basically, so, so when this is a matroid, what, what I'm going to define here is basically the, the bases, right? But here, I'm not actually assuming it's a matroid yet. But so basically, let B be the set of all B, where B is in the collection I, and it's maximal with respect to that property. So, and so B union X is not in I for any X, X minus B. So the, these are the maximal elements of I. <coughs> so what I want to prove is that the following are equivalent, the TFAE, the, the following are, clip, are, are equivalent. So first of all, um, so the prop, so Xi, so what we're interested in is, you know, an equivalent condition for saying that this is a matroid. So, so Xi is a matroid. In other words, since we already know it satisfies the first two conditions, we're saying that it satisfies the third condition. And we want to prove this is equivalent to the following statement. Um, so for all For any two, b and b prime and b, so these are the b is the maximal elements of i, and any x which is in b prime but not in b, we want to prove that there exists a y which is in b but not b prime, such that, <coughs> let me get this the right way around. So, so if you take b prime, you delete 
x, and then you replace it with y, this is in, this seems like a kind of weird condition, right? But, but this is, so in, in a lot of these things, what you should think about, remember we, uh, we, you know, one example of a matroid we had was, you know, the rows or the columns of a, of a matrix. Um, so if you think of these things as being bases, right, this is a property that holds in linear algebra. So whenever you take two bases for a space, you delete something which is in one but not the other, then there's something in the other one you can add to kind of make it a basis. And actually, we're going to have another property which is almost the same as this. So for all b and b prime in b, so it starts the same, and x in b prime minus b. And again, so there exists a y in b minus b prime, but we're going to have a slightly different conclusion. So such that, so this time I'm going to look at b. I'll delete y, and I'll add x. And this is another basis. So you can see, that, okay, these are slightly different statements, right? So here we're we're deleting something from b, adding something from b prime, whereas here we're dealing, deleting something from b prime, adding something from. Oh, and these. Uh, so these, these two things here, so just for your kind of reference, um, so these are called, usually called the basics, basis exchange property. So, well, yes, yeah, so I'm not sure exactly which one should be called the basis exchange property, but perhaps both of them should. Because it's basically saying from two bases, you can kind of exchange one element for another. Any questions about the, the statement of <clears throat> okay, so let's prove this. So we want to prove all these things are equivalent. So we'll prove, okay, so we need to, yeah. So we're going to prove that, that A implies B, that B implies C, and that C implies A. Right, so whenever you have this sort of cycle of implications, right, this proves that all of them are equivalent. Okay, so, so first, let's do that A implies B. Okay, so, so we're assuming A, right? We're assuming it's a matroid. So I can use words like independent set, basis, and things like that, right? Um, so, so we're assuming it's a matroid. So B is the set of bases for the matroid, right? Okay, so, so of course, okay, so let B and B prime be in B, and let X be any element of B prime minus B. And we want to show that this Y exists. But we're just going to use basically the this third property of being a matroid. Well, that's, that's the thing that we're supposed to be using, right? So, um, okay, so because these are, yeah, these are bases, and, and because we satisfy the second uh, property of being a matroid, so we have that, if I look at B prime minus X, this is of course an independent set, because B prime is independent, we satisfy the subset condition, so since, and because 2 is, is satisfied. <clears throat> and remember, by this lemma, oh, which I, oh yeah, I didn't erase. So this one, um, every two, any two bases have the same size, right? So, so if I look at B and B prime, they have the same size. And so therefore, if I look at B prime minus X, this is smaller than B, because I deleted something. And so by 3, so the third property of a matroid, I can, I can apply that where I just think of y as being b prime minus x and z as being b. So there exists some y, which is in b minus b prime minus x, which is, in fact, so since x was not in b, this is, in fact, equal to b minus b prime, right? Because x is not in b, so deleting it from whether you delete it or not has no effect. So such that if I take b minus x union y, it's an independent set. Okay, but actually what I want, I actually want this set to be a basis, right? Not just, it's not quite good enough to say it's an independent set, right? But it has to be a basis because, so we must have <coughs> that it's a basis. Otherwise, well, otherwise we could find a larger set containing it, which is a basis. Um, but this is be but this would be impossible because all bases have the same size. Okay, so this is so this is a basis because so how big is this set, right? It has size 
So I deleted one element. Oh, sorry, this should be, sorry, both of these should be B, right? I applied, yeah, I added something to B prime minus X, right? So this, this has to be a basis because if I look at how big it is, it has the same size as B prime, right? Because I deleted one thing and I added one thing, and all bases have the same size. So if this wasn't a basis, I could find a larger independent set that contains it. If I take the largest one, that'll be a basis. But if it strictly contains this, it'll be bigger than B prime. That'll be a contradiction. Any questions about any of that? Yeah, all of these things are not terribly exciting, right? But it's just going to be an exercise in, in playing with the definition. <laughs> OK, so that, that proves that A implies B. So next, actually, it's convenient to prove that uh, B implies C. Or sorry, C, sorry, no. Uh, yeah, naturally what you'd want to do is next prove B implies C. We're actually going to prove C implies A. So next. Okay, and this is strategic because actually we're going to use some of these things to actually prove B implies C. Um, okay, so, so now we're assuming uh, this condition and we want to prove that this thing is a matroid. So, yeah, so suppose it's not. So suppose that C holds and A doesn't. Right, and we want to get a contradiction. So, so therefore there exists, so, so, so this third condition of a matroid is violated, so there must exist Y and Z, which are independent sets. Or, okay, I shouldn't say independent set here because we're actually assuming it's not a matroid. So there exists y and z in i such that y is smaller than z and there doesn't exist an element of z that I can move over to y to get another element of i. So such that y union z, or sorry, x is in I, right? So that's what it means for A to fail. And so it's going to be useful to pick this in a sort of special way, right? So we can, so we know that there exists such sets Y and Z, and we can pick them to have some sort of extreme property. So we pick, pick such a Y, Z, so that their intersection is maximum. Among, so among all choices of y and z. So meaning, you know, among all the things that violate this condition, or all the things that satisfy what's written here, you pick the one which, the, which has the biggest intersection. Any questions about the leave this theorem statement? OK, so OK, so yeah, so y and z are in, are in I, so we can take some sort of maximal set in I that contains them, or that contains each of them. So, so, let, so we can take some elements of I where Y is contained in B prime and Z is contained, right? Just because the things, oh, sorry, I can, I can uh, sorry, this should be, right? Basically, so Y and Z are, in, or are in I, so I can take maximal things in I that contain them. OK, now we want to apply this, this condition. So, okay, so, so one thing is we cannot have y contained in b. OK, so y is in b prime. Z is a, a thing containing z, or sorry, b is something containing z. And what I'm saying is that you, you can't possibly have y contained in b, because if, you, if that was the case, so otherwise we let x be any element of z minus y, and we have that if I take y union x, this will still be contained in b because all of z is contained in b. And if we're assuming y is contained in b, then this will be contained in b, which would imply that y union x is in i by 2. Right? And we're assuming that y and z are chosen so that no such x exists. Is that clear? OK, so, so, y, is, so y is not contained in b. So it must have some element which is not in B. So there exists some 
x, which is in y minus b. <coughs> and of course, because y is contained in b prime, of course, uh, so x is actually in, it's of course also in b prime minus b, it's in y. So we can apply this condition c. So by c, there exists some y in b minus b prime such that the set, so I'll give it a name, b double prime, which is b minus y union x is in b. That's just what, what condition c says. It gives you the, this point y. Okay, so now, now what's the contradiction going to be? Well, so remember we chose these, this y and z to have this extreme property that they have the biggest possible intersection. So now we want to find some sets with a, with, which have the property that y and z have, and they have a higher intersection. So, so let z prime be the set z uh, minus y union x. Okay, so, like, so z prime is a subset of b double prime, right? Because z was contained in b, and we've done the same sort of operation of removing the same elements and adding the same element as we did with, to make b prime. And so, so it must be in I. This is a gain by. And um, if I look at, so, okay, so the size of Z prime is, of course, equal to the size of Z, which is bigger than Y, because I just deleted one thing and added one thing. And if I look at the intersection of Z prime and Y, this is, in fact, if you think about it, this is the same as the intersection of Z with Y plus it has, so where, so X is not in Z because x is not in b. So, so this intersection has size bigger and strictly larger than the intersection of z with y. And now the last thing to check is that, um, well, that there's still, there's still no element I can remove from z prime and add to y to get something in i. But that's not hard to see because actually if I look at z prime minus y, I believe that's the same z minus y. Yeah, because, so the, the only thing that I deleted from z was y, small y, because, but this was something which is not in, well, so, which is in b prime, or sorry, b minus b prime. It's really hard to keep track of all these primes. And, and so, okay, so what I'm saying is that z minus y is the same as z prime minus y, and we, we already knew that there was nothing in this set that I could add to y to make it, to keep it inside of i, and so there's also nothing in this set I can add to y. So this contradicts our choice of y and z. Okay, so that one's a bit more technical. Any questions about anything there? Okay, so, so now we've proved a implies b, c implies a. Um, the last thing to do is to prove that b implies c. Finally, we want to prove that b implies c. So this is actually gonna, this is sort of sneaky, the way we're going to do this. Um, we're going to use the fact that we've already implied, or we already proved A implies B and C implies A, and we're going to kind of, uh, and we're going to, well, we're going to do, do something involving taking complements, and it's all gonna boil down to one very simple uh, claim. So let me explain. So, so let, okay, so we're assuming, we're assuming B, we're trying to prove C, right? <clears throat> so this, so we have this collection B, and I'm going to take, I'm going to let B star be the set of all kind of complements of things which are in B. So it's a set of all X minus B, where B is in B, and let I star be the set of all things contained in these sorts of sets. So it's the set of all um, y such that y is contained in x minus b for some b and b. And when you define things this way, it turns out it's clear that so b star is the set of maximal elements of I. So it's sort of, so what I'm saying here is that if I look at, so if you look at the relationship between I and, and B, you have the same relationship between I star and B star. 
right? If, if I was to define I star first, then this, the set B star would be all the maximal elements of I star. So what we've already proven, so by what we've already proven, we know that, so, okay, what we've already proven is A implies B and C implies A. So, um, right, so we know that if, if B star satisfies C, what we've al we already proven would imply that I star satisfies A, right? Because we already know C implies A, and so, so we have this. Um, but we already know also that A implies B, so, so if this holds, then we know that this holds, and if this holds, we know that B star satisfies B. So this is something we already, so to finish the proof, um, and this I'll leave as an exercise, so this is actually written in the, uh, I guess, optional exercises for this week, um, but this is, this is quite easy to prove. So, so yeah, I'll write it somewhere else. Right, so to complete the proof, it suffices, um, so it suffices to prove the following. So I'll write this as a claim. So B satisfies condition B if and only if B star satisfies C. And of course, everything here is quite symmetric because we took complements, but I'll write this anyway. So B satisfies, so also B satisfies C if and only if B star satisfies, which, okay, you only actually really need to prove one of these because it's kind of symmetric, right? But then that would actually give you this whole proof, right? So, so if you start with assuming B satisfies B, we get that that implies B star satisfies C, which implies I star satisfies A, which implies B star satisfies B, which implies B satisfies C. Okay, so it's a long kind of chain of implications. Okay, and, and this is in the exercises. And it's, and you can take my word for it, that's quite easy to prove. <clears throat> so now what I want to do is, uh, yeah, so, so this proves one kind of equivalent condition to being a matroid. Basically this, so you have these basis exchange properties and either of them is equivalent to being a matroid. Um, so I don't have time to prove any more equivalent things about being a matroid, but I'll perhaps just state them. So, but of course, given that I'm not going to prove these things, you're of course not uh, expected to know how to prove them either. So you might remember this definition of the rank of a matroid or the rank of a, a set. So given a matroid xi and a subset y of x, the rank of, of y is the cardinality of b, where b is a basis for y. And we know that all bases have the same size. So, yeah. And we denote the rank by r of y. So r of y is the rank of y. So, right, so another equivalent definition of a matroid. So let uh, this be a collection that satisfies the matroid, the first two matroid axioms. And for a set y, in X, let R of Y be the max of B such that B is in I and B is a subset of Y. Okay, so what I want to say now is that the matroid, the condition of being a matroid is equivalent to some condition on the rank function. So, so the following are equivalent. So this is pairs in a matroid is equivalent to the rank function uh, satisfying the following. So R of S plus R of T, um, at least R of S union T plus R of S intersection T for all S and T 
So proof of this is in the notes, but <coughs> but I'm not going to have time to prove it. We also we also aren't going to actually apply this in any of the remaining lectures. So so me stating these things is sort of just for your mathematical you know background rather than something we're going to actually apply in the rest of the module. Um, so another thing I want to write is another another equivalent definition of a matroid involving something called a circuit. So, so given a matroid, xi, <coughs> a set C contained in x is a circuit if C is not independent, but Basically, any subset of it is independent. So C minus X is in I for all X and C. So I'm just going to state one more theorem. I think by now we remember these axioms. Theorem. So again, let XI satisfy 1 and 2, and let C be the collection of all C contained in X such that C is in I, or sorry, C is not in I, and C minus X is in I for all X and C. Then again, the following are equivalent. So again, this thing is the matroid. And the second condition is that for all C and C prime in C, with C not equal to C prime, and every point in the intersection of C and C prime, the set, so if I take C union C prime and I delete X, contains a set in script C. Okay, so I understand it's kind of, it's kind of hard to, uh, to see the point of me stating these things when, when we're not going to actually use them, but, it's, uh, but these, are, these are all kind of important facts in matroid theory. Um, and actually they can be quite useful in the sense that, so, so sometimes when you want to, so you have a certain kind of structure, you want to prove it's a matroid. Um, in some cases, you know, in some cases it might be easy to describe the independent sets. So for example, when we were looking at linear matroids, which were the matroids formed by the columns of a matrix, it's pretty easy to describe what it means for something to be independent, right? It's, uh, it's just linear independence. But in some cases, it's actually more convenient to describe um, what it means to be a circuit, or what it means to be minimally dependent. Um, and so in those cases, you may want to, uh, in order to verify it's a matroid, you might want to work with circuits um, instead of independent sets. Or, or similarly, you might want to work with bases, or you may want to work with the rank function. So this gives you lots of different ways of proving something is a matroid. Um, let's just, okay, so, so I know these all just seem like abstract definitions, so let's kind of connect this to some of the examples of, of matroids we've seen. So, so remember we've seen basically two examples of matroids so far. Graphic matroids and linear matroids. Right? So remember a graphic matroid, recall, given a graph G, um, so the pair, so if I take E, I, so E kind of here plays the role of X, uh, where I is the collection of all subsets of E such that the graph where you take the same vertex set as G, but you take the, the edge set E prime um, has no cycles. Uh, this is a matroid and it's called, you may remember from two lectures ago, ago it's called a graphic matroid. So can anyone tell me what the circuits are in this matroid? So a circuit, remember it's a set which is not in I, so it's a set of edges not in this set, uh, this collection I, but every subset is in I. Yep, yep. So basically, a cycle. Yeah, the edge set of a of a cycle itself. Yep, exactly. So well, actually, oh no. So that's not not quite correct because yeah. So the way you you phrase this is not quite correct because yeah, it, it would ha it has to be a cycle because for example, if I take this graph, this subgraph, it's not quite a circuit because if I was to delete this edge you don't get an independent set. Yep. So, so, but you're on the right track. So, so the circuits are 
edge sets of cycles. Right. <coughs> okay, so I think that's all for today. Uh, yeah, I'll see you tomorrow.